Got them. Extras. Yes, we'll put them down here. Got extras. Need one? Yep. So we need. Is that extra? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Send them up. All right. So now we're going to look at human impact on the environment. So this is, I think, naturally stuff that we're more interested in. Uh, stuff that's you know, maybe we've been exposed to uh, in terms of understanding environmental change. Uh, so when we go through this particular discussion. You know, I start off with this bird. Uh, this bird is from the Exxon Valdez oil spill, which was uh, some drunk guy was uh, operating a big, huge oil tanker, big, huge, massive boat. Uh, kind of got drunk, I think probably fell asleep, and then plow, clobbered into uh, in a big, huge landmass. And so essentially caused this huge oil spill, in which this was a massive amount of oil dumped into uh, the particular area of, of, of around uh, the Aleutian Islands there in uh, the southern part of Alaska. And so here's one of the, the, the images from uh, that particular event. And this is obviously an oily bird. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be asking and thinking deep about this. And so yeah, we got the oily bird. Yeah, we got pollution. It's quite obvious. We can see environmental change. Oil being dumped uh, out here in the middle of nowhere in this particular uh, large water body. But we're going to ask deeper questions as far as, you know, well, why is that oil there? Well, why is it that we see that it's actually being transported from one area of the world to other areas of the world? And key to understanding that is oil is a commodity that people want to consume. It's something that people need. Uh, when you think about oil, it's, you know, oil is plastic, plastic water bottle, oil produced it, petroleum. Uh, think about that fuel in your car, oil produced it. Uh, you look at, you know, much of so many products that we buy and use have oil or petroleum in it. And so what it is is going on is global consumption, global demand for oil is higher than it's ever been. And so it makes sense why this is a valuable resource, which is found in this area of the world, essentially where it's been picked up, it's been scooped up, it's been uh, you know, put into a big tanker, and it's being moved somewhere else where it's going to be refined into a product that we can use, uh, a fuel that we can put in our car, and so on. And so when we think about human impact in the environment, we're going to think about it more deep than just simply, oh, that's one oily bird. Uh, it's a bad day for that guy. Uh, we're going to ask, well, why is oil even in uh, this particular area, and why is it being uh, moved from one place to another? And the key to understanding this is this diagram here. I'll go ahead and kind of showcase the importance of this by saying this will be on the exam. Uh, so if you look at the exam for review guide, the question asks, for the human impact on the environment lectures, the diagram below was used. Fill in each box fill in each of the boxes and describe and illustrate the systems approach uh, in the space below uh, the five boxes, but focus solely on the first three boxes. Today's discussion is the first box. Uh, so today I'll focus purely on the very first box. Uh, next time I'll start coming up and start going in either via a video lecture next week or next week's Wednesday discussion. I'll then talk about the second and third boxes. Obviously, filling in the names of the five boxes, it ain't that hard to do. Here they are right there. Uh, so here they are right there. So filling in the names is the first part. But on a future exam, when I give you this question on that first that future exam four, you're just going to focus then on, the, as far as describing human driving forces, human activities, and environmental change. And as the arrows imply, we have a system, kind of this chain reaction. And so once again, we think of human driving forces. The fact that I right now want to put uh, fuel in my gas tank, uh, have that desire right now, that's not causing environmental change. Uh, but it's going to lead to that when someone pumps out that oil from underground and then puts it in the tank and then will go into my car. Further, uh, we'll look at human driving forces, one key driving force that's causing environmental change, more babies being born. And so the act of making babies, the act of giving away, or sorry, I don't know what I'm doing here, but the act of producing a baby, uh, that's not going to cause environmental change. We're going to start cutting down trees and start, you know, you know, you know, trying to acquire all these resources, but nonetheless, more people, more resources being consumed. And so what this is is a systems approach. And so what happens is with the second box, human activities, that's where we actually see direct change. That's like mining. That's like cutting down, cutting down a forest for timber. That's actually where we do see environmental change. But once again, that is led by consumption, demand for paper, a demand for oil, more people. 
more resources and all of that. And nonetheless, when we start chopping down trees, especially when we do it in large numbers, that then leads to environmental change. So then we cut down all the trees. Uh, now we have fewer amounts of you know, trees spewing out uh, that friendly thing we like called oxygen. Uh, further trees provide a lot of, uh, of other things, uh, particularly dense forests. Uh, so they provide other things. And so when you cut those down, now we have the consequences. Now we have to deal with that. Uh, lower amounts of trees, lower amounts of forested areas. Then we've got to come up with solutions. So we have these consequences that we have to deal with. Then we have to come up with solutions. And I argue that the best way to think about solutions, when we think about how to lessen our human impact on the environment, we need to think about solutions for all these individual parts of this system. Uh, so that's what these arrows are insinuating. The arrows go into crossing, a chain reaction. One thing leads to the next. And so today's discussion is going to be focused purely on uh, that first box. Human driving forces, things that are indirect. They're not going to cause trees to go down and fish it to be you know, over-harvested in certain areas, but nonetheless, they're going to lead to that in terms of the next box human activities. And so here's human driving forces. And so that's the focus of today's discussion. And so hopefully by the end of this, we'll be able to you know, explain kind of this buildup as far as how we understand environmental change it starts with these initial driving forces. And so as I said, human driving forces are indirect, indirectly going to impact the environment. Uh, so they're simply trends. Uh, you know, one of the things I'll come back to is, uh, is world population. In 1900, there was 1.6 billion people. 100 years later, just 100 years later, it went up to 6.1 billion people. Uh, so that's obviously a societal trend. We're growing. The world population is growing, especially there in the 20th century. And so the fact we have this world population growth, that's a trend. Uh, that's a trend, and of course that's going to lead to more resources being consumed. More people need more resources. And so these human driving forces, as it says uh, there in the lecture notes, these are big picture societal trends that are going to indirectly uh, start to degrade the environment, lead to uh, indirectly lead to environmental stress. Uh, so when we try to understand environmental uh, change, we have to first start off with this human driving forces. And the best way to do this is a formula. Have you, have you heard of the IPAT formula? Perfect. Uh, only about three or four people have. Uh, so every time I come across the IPAT formula and try to explain it, uh, very rarely has anybody ever heard of it. But it's extremely useful for understanding human impact, uh, understanding environmental impact caused by humans. It's a very, very simple formula. Even the math challenge can understand. And here's the formula. I equals P times A times T. So in any formula, what happens if A increases? What will happen to I? It's going to go up. What happens if P goes up? What happens to I? It goes up. What happens if P goes down? I goes down. So you can see how this kind of this math formula, you can see this interrelatedness. So I equals P times A times T. I equals environmental impact. That's what I stands for. It stands for environmental impact. I being impact. P, population. So population goes up. Human impact on the environment also goes up. Uh, A stands for affluence. And so think of that just as consumption per person. Uh, you go to you know, Latin America or parts of Asia, People don't have the, uh, the new I, uh, iPhone watch. They don't have uh, you know, iPhones, iPads, uh, whatever uh, pads you got. Uh, so they're, you know, they're consuming a whole lot less than we are. Why? Because we can afford it. We've got a more affluence. We are a wealthier country with wealthier people, higher income people. So because of that, we have higher levels of affluence. And so because of that, we have more stuff. We buy more stuff. We use more stuff. We use more energy. And I got plenty of data to showcase and further uh, explain that. A, or, uh, T, technology, kind of goes hand in hand with affluence. Now I'll try to separate those a little bit later on in this particular discussion. Uh, but technology, what that means is as your technology, as your level of technology increases, uh, there becomes increasing demand for resources to make uh, those technologies. And instead of spilling the beans now, I'll just wait to use my examples uh, at a later example or a later moment to uh, showcase technology and further emphasize what it means. And so you also have another question from uh, the exam uh, for review guide. And it's describe the formula A equals P times A times T. And I just pretty much gave you the first part, and that's what those letters stand for. So now let's go a little bit more in depth. Uh, let's try to understand population. 
Uh, so adding a little human geography to this, world population. Uh, we can see we went from 1,900 1.6 billion people. Just in 100 years, we went from 1.6 to 6.1 billion. That is a massive change. Have you, anybody, uh, anybody born in the 20th century here? We all should be raising our hands. So obviously we can tell who's not paying attention. So the 20th century, you were born. How cool is this? You were born in the most dramatic demographic century there will ever be in the history of human beings. Never, ever, ever will population grow like it did in the 20th century. Never before has it grown like that. And never again will it grow like that. And we can see 1.6 to 6.1 billion. That's a huge increase. It's nearly quadrupled in just 100 years. And so there's no doubt that that increase in population is going to lead to environmental change. It's going to definitely lead to uh, changes, and lead to increasing demand for stuff, whether it be clothing items, whether it be cars, or whether it be homes, what have you. And we can see by 2050, that's not slowing down. Uh, by 2050, so probably by the time I die, uh, the world population will be about 9.3 billion people. Uh, so we're only going to be adding more and more people over time. Uh, about a billion people every uh, 15 to 20 years. And so when we think about population growth, there's no doubt that it's going to have a large environmental impact, especially as we see more people being added to the world population. And as I said, how cool is it you are alive during the most dramatic demographic century there will ever be? Even during Jesus' time, go back to the Romans, go back even further to uh, you know, all those people you get bored of tears with in history class, all of them never had a demographic century ever like ours. Uh, so how lucky are we? Uh, so here's one way to showcase this. And this is called the exponential population growth. And so just kind of look here at the bottom. World population is kind of... And then boom, here comes the 20th century. And so the 20th century, a huge population growth just in that one little sliver. And there's a guy named John Denver who's dead. I think he got really high. Uh, and decided to go uh, um, fly his plane. Not a good idea. And he went right into a cliff. There's a famous line from him, this song. We're not going to listen to the whole song. But the famous line from this song is more people, more scars on the land. And so it's a great, simple way to showcase population growth. More people, more resources needed, and thus environmental impacts could increase. Um, great time. Where is this in the world? Where in the world is this? It's what? New York. Oh, oh you, yeah, you've seen this before. Uh, this is this is New York. Wait a minute, New York doesn't look like that. What they've done is this person. What they did was they essentially kind of did what what they thought uh, uh, New York would have looked like before humans came into this in this particular area. Uh, New York City. I don't know if you know this, but it's the largest city in the United States. And so a great way to showcase population growth, large amounts of population in one particular area, and so environmental impact. Uh, there's no doubt. Uh, that this is a clear way to showcase increasing population, we're going to see changes in the environment. Uh, so what is today uh, New York City used to be obviously a uh, wilderness. Uh, even, uh, you know, I might talk about the natives. All right, uh, so when we look at world population growth, uh, where is it occurring? It's occurring overwhelmingly in what we call developing countries. And just to make this simple, lower income poorer countries of the world. And so when we look at this particular formula, why I also like it, we can start saying, hey, you people, hey, you particular groups, you need to watch this particular thing. Uh, so in the case of a lot of the developing countries, lower income countries, poorer countries of the world, population growth, it's unsustainable. They need to slow down the population growth. Now, I'm not going to be the person that goes there and says, hey, you need to start having abortions. I'm definitely not going to do that. I'm not going to go there and say, hey, you need to stop having kids. No, I'm definitely not going to do that. Uh, but there's no doubt that there needs to be more awareness in these countries of the huge population growth that's occurring there. This is something that China recognized back in the 1970s, and they created a policy which a family could only have one child. I don't know if you've heard of that, uh, the one-child policy. So they recognized the fact that population growth, it's cool and all, but it's not great for the environment, not great for uh, resources and all of that. So we look at where is population growing the fastest, 
It's growing the fastest in developing countries, which we also say are lower income uh, countries. And so definitely, that's the key problem there. Uh, and so where, uh, you could say, uh, uh, going forward, places like Latin America, uh, South Asia, uh, uh, parts of, uh, of, of Sub-Saharan, parts of Africa, are by far the places that are going to see uh, the largest population growth. Now let's look at the top seven contributors to world population. So we can start looking at the countries that add the most to world population. And number one, India. Uh, India is adding the most to its population, but its growth rate, it's slowing down. Uh, so it's starting to see a slowdown in its population growth, uh, but by about 15 years from now, it'll be the world's largest country. Right now, China is, uh, but India will soon surpass it. Number two, of course, uh, is, is uh, India's kind of rival, kind of buddy, uh, that's a good friend, China. Uh, number three is Nigeria. I remember vividly that Nigerian student I had back in uh, da, 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 spring of 2009, sat somewhere in the middle, and I showed this, he got really excited. I think he even put his fist in the air, like, hell yeah, that's awesome. Not so much, not so fast, my friend. Uh, so Nigeria, yeah, it's got, you know, it's got, it's number three. It's ranked quite high, that's great. Uh, but the problem with Nigeria, it's only so big. Uh, so it's extremely overpopulated. In Nigeria, we see a lot of the issues is the fact that you don't have enough resources for that population. Uh, and so in Nigeria, the environmental impact uh, is definitely the fact they're overpopulated. Uh, there's too much competition over those few little resources uh, that are available in this you know, somewhat small country. It's about the size of Texas. I know Texas is the small, uh, but uh, Texas also isn't a country. Uh, anyway, uh, Pakistan, number four, another small country, even further, it's a big old desert with this one little river, and everybody lives there along the river. So huge population pressures uh, there. Uh, number five is the USA. Wait a minute, we're not a developing country. We're not a low-income country. Uh, what's going on there is, is, in fact, we attract a lot of immigrants. Uh, so we are growing because of immigration. Uh, so I don't know if you've heard about this. This has been in the news uh, the last couple of years. And that's the fact that we're growing uh, because of immigration. So often the immigrants who move to the United States aren't old people. Uh, they're typically younger people. Uh, so younger people then move here and then have their babies here. Uh, so it's definitely something you see in the United States, and so that's why we're one of the top contributors to world population growth, but not really a developing lower income country. Indonesia, number six, and Bangladesh, number seven. Any idea what number th three, four, six, and seven have in common? I guess to a certain extent, one. Why they have such high population growth? This is a cultural thing. Really? Muslim. Uh, so uh, uh, Nigeria, Pakistan, Indonesia, Bangladesh, all Muslim countries. You're probably thinking, well, India, they're Hindu. 10% of the Indian population is Muslim. And 10% of a billion is actually quite a lot. Uh, so what you see here is the role of the Muslim faith. Uh, so I don't know if you know anything about Islam. Anyone know anything about Islam? Anyone want to share? Uh, what's their view of, uh, of, of uh, uh, how do I say this? Uh, uh, contraception. What's up? They don't use them. Uh, the, the morning after pill. Nope. Uh, uh, did, 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 uh, it's been so long. Uh, 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 whatever. Uh, you get my drift. Uh, anyway. Uh, so, oh, I have to edit that out. Uh, so we look at the countries that are growing. It's not so much India and China. They're just already sneaking big. Uh, they're already quite big as, as it is. They're actually slowing down. Uh, and it's a lot of it's that one child policy. It's working. You can see it's, it's, it's a result. But on the left hand side, all those uh, lines going up are all countries that are increasing in population. And so in these places, more people, more scars upon the land. And so if we zoom into Nigeria. Uh, so here, Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria, the northern part of the country, it's desert. And the southern part of the country, it's rainforest. So there's this little sliver through the middle in which it's actually arable, in which there's actually agriculture can be done there, and resources can be gained from food and all of that, uh, from ag and all, uh, all that good stuff. Uh, so Nigeria already has a situation where it's you know, kind of small, uh, but also as far as its usable land, it's even smaller, and so that overpopulation, that huge population growth is a key problem. And the thing is, it ain't slowing down. How do we know that? We can look at what we call population pyramids. And so all this is is the age and sex of, uh, structure of, of a country. Uh, men on the left, females on the right. And so you can see young people at the bottom, and the age going up is older people. And it makes sense. And as you get older, once you get over the age of 80, there's fewer and fewer 80-year-olds. Naturally, people die off. But you can see a ton of young people. 
And so that's one of the things that population growth here is a huge concern because it ain't going to slow down. Uh, essentially, what we got is more young people means more young people that are soon going to have their children. And so this is a very young population, but a fast-growing a, a, a population that's only going to continue to grow. Now let's go over to India. Uh, India uh, is a country, you can see the Alice Pyramid. You can see how it starts to come in like a Hershey Kiss. What that means is you're seeing slow down of population growth. It's slowly happening. So if you want to look at what's happening in a population at the moment, look at the bottom of the pyramid. That shows you what's going on right now. And you can see how you see the changes occurring, which is much different than Nigeria, which every single group at the bottom gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Is the world overpopulated? This is kind of one of those philosophical questions. Uh, if you want to, you can go have a beer and talk about it. Uh, but it depends on how your perspective is. Uh, is the world overpopulated? You know, is, is the world crowded? I don't know. It depends on your view of what's crowded. Uh, you, know, you know, what I think is crowded might be different than somebody who lives in Mumbai, uh, lives in an urban slum in Mumbai, India, in which three people all share a room. Uh, hell no, I'm not going to share a room with two other people. It's so crowded, eh, overpopulated. It depends on your view of what is overpopulated. But there's this stat here. 75% of the world's population lives on only 5% of the Earth's surface. So three-fourths of the population lives on just a little bit of the surface uh, of Earth. But what might be some problems with that statistic? Yeah? Uh, a lot of the land that we don't live on, people just physically can't live on. Under for example? That, you want an example? Yeah, for, yeah, for example, sorry. Uh, let's see. Sorry. Well, I don't know if the oceans count or not. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and throw that one out. That's not obvious. But where else? So the, the white places. Yeah. Um, Carmel. No, no. no. <laughs> uh, 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 Greenland. Antarctica. Deserts. The Sahara, Sahara Desert. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, the uh, Kalahari Desert. The Outback. Uh, you know, much of the American West, no one wants to live in Canada. <laughs> and so essentially, we got all this, you know, as far as where humans actually would want to live, you know, that makes that statistic, you know, as far as where we would like to live, we call that arable land. Uh, it's a whole different view of things. And so this statistic makes it seem like, oh, yeah, we can keep on going. There's nothing going to stop population growth. Uh, but when we look at how much is actually livable, a much different pattern. Sorry, we don't be playing in that tune. Unless it works. No. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't matter. No one knows my songs anyhow. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to look at world population today, uh, just kind of looking at some big trends happening. And so once again, indirectly impacting the environment. Uh, so the first one, why population growth grew so fast in the 20th century? People living longer. Uh, so essentially, that we can thank our doctors, we can thank our scientists, our researchers, we're coming up with new ways to prolong life. Uh, so whether it be fighting off those things that used to kill us, like tuberculosis, malaria, measles, oh, not so fast, uh, not, not anymore. Uh, so all these things that are no longer around is all things that are leading to longer lifespan. Further, the distribution of medical awareness and knowledge, we're just more aware of the things that we can do and we can't do, uh, things that are going to be good for our health. Uh, the things that are bad for our health. We all know those now uh, in much higher uh, numbers than we did beforehand. So that's the first reason why population grew uh, so fast. And so that's one characteristic for sure happening right now. Also what's going on though is kind of the same thing, an opposite thing. Fertility is the average number of children a woman will have in her lifetime. Uh, so that's a question I used to ask, but I guess that's too personal, so I'm not going to ask that. But when I used to ask that question, I asked, anybody want to have five kids? Anyone want to have four? Three? Maybe someone raised their hand. Two? One? Maybe a couple raised their hand. Zero? Lots of people want to have zero kids, which I don't know what's going to happen there. Uh, but what's happening is women are having more say in their reproduction. Uh, they're starting, you know, they're going to school. They're going to college. Uh, they're getting a job. Then they're starting about family, starting to think about families. And so what's happening at the same time is we're starting to see changes occurring. And a lot of this is tied to gender equality, which I'll get to here in a minute. Uh, so what's happening, you're seeing declines in fertility rate. What does that have to do with population? 
it means it's going to start slowing down. And that's why we see, well, why I made that argument or that, you know, that proclamation uh, that you'll never see a century like that ever again because population starting to slow down. Although it's still growing, I'm not saying it's a uh, but it is starting to slow down. Women are having fewer and fewer children uh, over time. Another characteristic you're seeing that definitely relates to environmental impact is we have more people moving all over the world. And if you don't know, let's go outside and watch the kids playing frisbee right now. Uh, it's like the who's who of Asian countries that are represented out there. Uh, so you see this on our college campus overwhelmingly. You can see the outcome of international migration. Uh, and so a lot of times when I, when I say that, people get all freaked out. Like, oh, you international people are take all our jobs. Maybe. Uh, but also keep in mind that you can move too. You can migrate across the world as well. So there's a lot more job opportunities beyond our borders than ever before. Uh, so it's a two-way street for sure. But what that means is more people moving uh, also means more resources being used. So I'll get to that here uh, in a minute. Further, increased urbanization. More and more people moving to cities. Uh, why does that play a key role? Uh, more and more people moving to cities uh, is only going to add to more and more of the CO2 or the air pollution that's overwhelmingly found in urban areas. Air pollution is more of an urban issue. And so more people moving to urbanized areas, more people moving to cities, more people driving their cars in cities means more air pollution. And so increased urbanization is an indirect lead to uh, changes in our environment. As more people then move to, the, to cities, drive cars, and we can see air pollution more, uh, uh, more uh, uh, present there in urban areas. Uh, so places are just only going to grow. It's just uh, another stat that shows how the world is growing, in particular in uh, urban areas. Like I mentioned before, progress in women's equality. So we try to understand, I know some of you know Snicker, how can we lessen our P? How can we lower our P? How can we lower that population rate? Gender equality is the answer. Uh, so it's by far the number one thing that I would argue is going to cause population to slow down. Instead of women being viewed as baby makers, women actually starting careers, uh, actually having say in their reproduction. Uh, which in the United States, yeah, we've already been there. We've been there, done that uh, much more uh, than other places in the world. Although it's still true that women in the United States don't make as much money as men for the same job, which is a crock. Anyway, uh, so this is one example in the United States, I mean, as far as our classroom. That's, that's old day, that's 15 years ago. But look at our classroom. Well, uh, yeah, look at our classroom today. Look at it when it's full. Look at it when this whole entire campus. You're going to see more women, more females, more girls on our campus than men. Uh, so that's something you definitely see in the United States. So gender equality is here. Uh, but you look at other places in the world, Latin America, South Asia, not so much. Uh, it's still lagging behind. Sub-Saharan Africa, same deal. Uh, so improving gender equality is a solution, going back to that previous systems approach, a solution to uh, increasing population. Our next one is the A, affluence. Uh, so this is a very obvious idea. The more money you have, the more stuff you can buy. The more stuff you buy is more resources. And so we look at it, the average American has, you know, everyone has their own bedroom, every single you know, house pretty much has a washer and dryer, refrigerator, all the amenities, all the appliances, all the things that one would need. Uh, but of course, in other areas of the world, they don't have washing machines. Well, why have a machine do something they can do by hand for free, uh, they would ask. Uh, so it's a simple idea, increasing affluence uh, leads to increasing environmental degradation or increases the eye. And in my other class I teach, we use the table of funk, this uh, big, huge, massive table that's full of all kinds of good, uh, goodness, uh, good, goodies or whatever. Uh, so what we've got here is we've got three different variables. Uh, the variables are energy use, and it's measured in kilograms of oil equivalent per person. Uh, we've got CO2 emissions, synthetic air pollution uh, per person. But we also have electric power consumption, so resources, using resources, using electricity. And you can see, as you go from left to right, low income, much lower in all of those. But as you increase affluence, energy use increases, CO2 emissions increase, but also power consumption also increases. And so whereas population in the United States and Europe, hell, Europe's depopulating. Go to Italy. Italy's begging for people to have babies. They're begging for young people to move uh, to Italy. Uh, and so we actually had a finance minister of Italy uh, who is translated loosely was our women need to make babies. Uh, so when the finance minister of Italy is saying, hey, it's in our best economic interest to start making more babies, 
uh, you can kind of see uh, how that's becoming more of a concern there. But population, not an issue there. We look into fluids, definitely in those developed countries, higher income countries, thinking about coming up with solutions. Not saying, hey, we need to stop doing whatever we're doing. We need to stop using our TV. Hell, I watched 40 hours of sports this weekend. I wouldn't trade that for the world. I don't want you to take away my TV and all my, actually my two TVs. I got two TVs going on. I don't want to take that away from me. And so when we think about a lot of this stuff, we have to be kind of cognizant. We don't want to lessen our lifestyle, but we have to start thinking about our future. I'm getting ready to start having children. As I think about my kids' kids, it becomes different. I think I want them to live in a better place. I want them to have access to these resources uh, before they all uh, get depleted, especially those re uh, non-renewable resources like oil, coal, and natural gas. Anyway, uh, so I wanted to showcase some fluids. This is kind of you know, hashtag first world problems. Uh, so we look at you know, fluids, mowing your lawn. You know, go to South Asia, go to Africa. You think they're concerned about having their uh, lawn, uh, uh, lawn mowed perfectly, uh, like that old guy is in that neighborhood, the suburban area that you might live in, uh, who always has a perfectly manicured yard and gets all pissed off when other people don't have their yards all perfect. Such a first world problem. In lawn mowers, you think about having a nice lawn, that's all that water. Water that's not going to people to drink, to hydrate ourselves so we don't get cramps and die. Uh, but also, it's going to lawn to make it look nice and green. Uh, further, 17 million gallons spilled by lawnmower operators uh, each year. And so once again, we looked at that earlier oil spill. A big, huge oil spill. I didn't really get a sh chance to show you how big it was, but a huge amount of area. Still though, Joe the plumber, Joe the teacher, uh, Sally, the, uh, Sally the intern, uh, whatever, we're the ones that are actually changing our oil. And so when we change our oil, we don't really do it professionally. We go, oh, take it out, let's watch it dribble on the ground. And as we learn with watersheds, all that eventually goes somewhere. It's going to lead to, obviously, uh, pollution. And so that's a kind of way to kind of conceptualize, well, wait a minute. That was one point in one moment of an oil spill every single year across the country. People are spilling oil left and right just from uh, mowing their yard, from uh, changing the oil in their uh, lawnmower. We hear, uh, here we have a guy named Peter Minzel. What he does is he goes to people's, uh, across the world, and he goes to people's houses. Uh, so what he did here is he visited this, uh, uh, or their, this, these villages, uh, these, these places where people live, and what he does is he goes, all right, I want you uh, to put all of your stuff that you eat, all of your food items, and I want, to put it, I want you to put it where you eat those food items. And so here's a family in Guatemala, uh, which they spend $31 on food each week. Why is the number so much higher here? Go back and forth. We got the cash. What's up? We have cash to get all this extra stuff. Affluence, definitely. So affluence. Uh, so we pay for the luxury of having someone deliver that pizza to me. You pay for the luxury of that uh, you know, those, those containers that can ship something from California all the way to Indiana and ship that food to us. Here, much more local sources for the food. Uh, everything's going to be found more, you know, somewhere nearby. Further, look at the materials. Reusable stuff. Uh, reusable bags, uh, which you see a lot of stuff collected in. And it's from a, low, you know, from a place that's more nearby, so transportation costs aren't going to be high, as high. And so when you're paying for your food, you know, the same thing would feel everyone's belly, everyone's happy. Uh, you're paying for so many other things. Oh, that's, that's each week. You know, that's each week, exactly. Yeah. And so here you've got you know, all the various materials, glass, metal, plastic. Like uh, and I'm not talking about the KSC, I'm talking about the, actually the thing, the plastic, uh, the container. Uh, cups. Uh, we got, you know, when we think about this bacon, is that bacon? Someone just gave me maple flavored bacon jerky. Oh my god, it's still in my mouth. It's the most, most beautiful thing I've ever tasted. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, so you're paying for the person who makes this box. Uh, the engineer who made this pretty package to make it super thin, super light, uh, but also protect the, uh, uh, protect the bacon. Uh, you pay for the person who designed this. So you're paying for so much more stuff than the people here are paying. And so that's another way to showcase the fluids. Uh, there's so many more transportation materials and stuff that are added beyond just the caloric intake from uh, the edible, item, uh, edible items. Uh, further, uh, another first world problem is junk mail. I mean, I get every day in my office, I get about four or five little things, in which I, the first thing I do is I walk out from the mailbox and just throw them away. Uh, so junk mail, that's all pieces of paper, that's all you know, resources. 
and you don't see huge amounts of junk mail in South Asia, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and all those developing countries. Definitely a first world problem. It's those damn marketers and salespersons. Uh, I'm going to act like I was creepy once. I really did not do this, uh, but you can probably go ahead and predict uh, and kind of visualize this, visualize this in your own mind. Uh, what I did was I observed some. I go to Marsh every day. I go to Marsh, and they got that self-checkout thing. Uh, so I observed someone the other day, in which they had one little pop, one little thing of aspirin. Uh, so they take the aspirin, they take it across the self-checker, and all of a sudden, boom, it, the sign says, you need to place that in the bag. You need to place that in the bag. So then they put it in the bag, uh, because it said, you've got to put it in the bag. If not, this machine won't continue on. And so essentially they take, they take the debit, do, 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 slide a car, do, take that bag, and they take that bag to the front door, and they get to the front door, and they take out the box of aspirin and throw the plastic bag away. What is the lifespan of that plastic bag? Uh, five seconds. About five seconds. Where does the plastic bags, where does that come from? Where does that plastic? Oil, petroleum, resources. Uh, so once again, plastic bags. Huge amount of plastic bags are used uh, here in the United States. So we just kind of just grab it and throw them away. Uh, but once again, we want to reduce our dependence on oil. There's one simple way, less than the amount of plastic bags. You've seen this uh, in a lot of places in which they're actually now charging you uh, to use plastic bags. Uh, so it's kind of how companies are kind of getting, their, uh, getting involved in this environmental impact. Further, we look at where population in the world is growing the fastest. It's growing the fastest, as we can see here, uh, where, where the world population is growing, it's growing extremely fast there along the red line, which is the equator. And so essentially, world population is growing the fastest uh, there in, in tropical areas of the world. But let's add one more thing to that. Not only is world population growing the fastest, also affluence is growing extremely fast there. People across the, tropi uh, across the tropics, whatever continent you're on, they're now having a little bit extra income. More extra income, they can buy things they never bought. Uh, so if you're in a tropical area, which is hot every single day, it's 85 degrees every single day, hot and muggy, one luxury item you've never had that you want to buy, air conditioners, refrigerators. And so one of those things is those are by, two byproducts, or sorry, a byproduct from air conditioners and refrigerators is what? Anybody know? What's produced from those? Something called chlorofluorocarbon, CFCs. And I think I mentioned this in a previous uh, time in the semester. So those chlorofluorocarbons are only going to increase as more and more people are using air conditioners and, and uh, refrigerators in these tropical areas. Uh, so that's another way to kind of showcase how certain areas have population problems, but also the, kind, of, kind, of, kind of be aware of the influence as well. And so I've shown this before, this is my bad joke, uh, but this is a uh, company in India in which they're making a $2,000 brand new car. Uh, so once again, cars are becoming much more affordable. You know, you know, Ford and Chevy and all of Toyota, they love the American market. We're great. We drive cars. But the market they really love, India, China, why? Because hardly anyone drives cars. But not so fast, my friend. In the next 10 to 15 years, there's going to be a huge boom in the number of people driving cars. More cars, more resources to make those cars. I mean, you've got to think about that as well as far as resources but also more CO2 emissions. Cars emit air pollution. Uh, so even the electric car. Yeah, electric car might have zero emissions, but think about all the resources used to make that car. Think about all the resources used to get that car from where it's made to you uh, there, you, you the consumer in Whitestown, Indiana, where the hell you're from. Uh, if anyone's from Whitestown, I apologize. I really don't know. Uh, but anyway, so Tata Motors is making an extremely affordable car that more and more people can uh, Use. Where in the world is this? I know you're, I know you're, Indiana. This is Indiana. Northern Indiana, remember I talked about the glaciated Northern Indiana. Uh, Northern Indiana used to look a lot like this. It was full of swamps and marshy areas. Uh, but over time, what happened was they cleared these areas for agriculture. And that's a sign that that's something that was you know, related, related to population growth. Uh, so more people, so they want to convert that to agriculture because more people, more food, and so it's a way to make money. But also affluence, to clear this area, to all of a sudden put in ditches and irrigation channels, and to just change this landscape into that flat, barren landscape of nothing but corn and beans, corn and beans. It took a huge amount of affluence. And so it also showcases the rise of affluence in the United States in which we clear these areas, and we can do that with 
uh, obviously more money to, you know, to pour on these new technologies to come in and clear these areas out. That was in the 1900s. Uh, so Indiana used to look a ton like this, uh, but now uh, not so much. And this is up uh, by the Great Lake, uh, by uh, the, the, the Lake Michigan, uh, for those who are at home. Uh, here's one of my favorite cities in the world that I've never been to, Dubai. Uh, so here's an area of Dubai in 2000. So here we're going to see massive urbanization. Uh, Dubai is in the Middle East. If you don't know anything about the Middle East, it's dry. Also, it's oil rich. It's got a lot of money from oil. In fact, that's where all its money is from. And so the people in Dubai recognize this as a problem. Uh, first off, you know, what happens when oil runs out? They're screwed because their whole entire economy is to, you know, centered around oil. Uh, what happens when people just suddenly don't want to use oil anymore? They're screwed big time. And so they're, to use a finance term, they're diversifying their portfolio. They're trying to add to their economy by adding more things besides oil. And so what they've done is they really put their, uh, their eggs in development, creating a lot of amenities that people want. And so in this map here, this area, what it is is red, it's a remote sensed photo. What is red is vegetation. Keep in mind, uh, this is an area, one of the driest areas of the world, where they very rarely get precipitation. Now go ahead and I'll flash in 2010 area. So we'll get to those islands out there. We'll get to those in a minute. Uh, but nonetheless, a lot of things you can see, you can see the massive urbanization. You can see how it's spread and more resources being used. But look at all that red on the map. So look at all that vegetation being added. All these neighborhoods and all these things are trying to get people, the wealthy people from all over the world to come, move to Dubai. Uh, they have a, a racetrack at the bottom right uh, where that red dot is. And that racetrack is essentially for rich people to come down and bring their Ferraris, bring their, uh, their, uh, their Lamborghinis down here and drive. Uh, so we're catering to the mega rich across the world. Further, they build an indoor ski slope in a desert in the tropics. Uh, an indoor ski slope. Uh, but this is a city that's just massively grown. Even further, yeah, there's those islands out in the sky. Or out in the, out in the sky. Out, I got Lucy in the sky with diamonds in my head all day long. I've been humming as we been walking around here. But anyway, uh, so what this is is essentially creating islands in an ocean, in a water body. So environmental change, yeah, you're creating land masses that didn't exist beforehand. But also adding vegetation, which increases the demand for fresh water, which ain't found here. Uh, so they have to truck it in. So that's resources being used just to get water so they can have a little vegetation, their shade trees, uh, their little moats, wherever the hell those are, uh, here in Dubai. This gives you a scale. I mean, these are like caramel-sized homes uh, along on this island, uh, these, these palms. Uh, I mean, these are massive. Massive developments. Uh, the people, hey, obviously supply and demand. People are coming uh, in large numbers. Uh, here is our good friend Russia. Uh, so one of the things is increasing affluence. When you become a wealthier country, you go out and try to get the Olympics to come. So you can then you know burn through billions of dollars, and then two weeks later, three weeks later after the event's over, you got nothing left. Uh, so here's Sochi before the Olympics, and here's after. This place is a ghost town. You remember they had the dogs that were running around during the Olympics? They're still running around. There's no one here. Uh, so they did all of this to showcase the rest of the world. Hey, we're not communists and backwards. Uh, we actually got our stuff together. Look at look what we've done here. Uh, well, look, look what you've done here is you bankrupt this, uh, this country even further. Uh, but what are you going to do with this? This is an environmental limit. You're just changing the environment for these, all these structures that you only use three weeks of the entire year, uh, one particular year, one particular decade, one particular century. Next up is technology. So technology and influence kind of go hand in hand. Uh, but when we think about iPhones, every single one has one. Everyone's got one, or, or Android, where the hell it is. Everyone's got one. Uh, so what's happening is, you know, as soon as a new one comes out, man, people, people, it doesn't matter if it's sleet, uh, rain, cold, hot, people will wait in a massive line uh, to, you know, stay up till midnight, come to the store, buy their brand new iPhone that they can just wait till 8 a.m. and buy. Uh, but nonetheless, it showcases people, they've got to have the new one, got to have new technology, got to have the latest, greatest thing. Further, think about laptops. Uh, my old laptop, or the laptop I don't use, uh, but what happened was two years ago, uh, the school the school said, Andy, you need to get a new laptop. I said, hell no, I want the one I have. I'm happy with it, I don't want to change everything. I don't want Windows 8, that sucks. And so essentially what I had to do is I had to give up my laptop because its three-year term, three term was up. And so once again, more resources. You know, we got all kinds of minerals and metals and all kinds of things and elements and all kinds of things that are part of a computer that makes it go. It made me get a new computer where I didn't even want one. 
that kind of showcases affluence, but also uh, technology. Why technology? We have much higher amounts of industrial, but also hazardous waste. Uh, so a good example, that's the computer chip industry. And so we think about computer chips. Computer chips, that's the industry. If you want to manufacture something, you want to manufacture computer chips. Why? Because that's where the money is made. The money is not made in to you know, toasters like India or, 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 or China or socks like India. That's never going to make money. You're going to make money on computer chips. Why? These phones, these devices, all of them. Why do we like them? They're lighter than ever. They're more powerful than ever. They're smaller than ever. They're thinner than ever. What's going on there is computer chips are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. What that means is these chips, these small little chips, can produce and store a mass amounts of memory, which is what we like. We like having smaller uh, computer chips. But just to make one computer chip, the massive amounts of resources. In fact, 700 times the number, the amount of resources used just to make that chip are, are sorry, I messed that up. Let me just get my stats In order to produce one memory chip that weighs two grams, the total amount of materials and fossil fuels required to make that chip is 1,400 grams. That's 700 times the weight of the original chip. Why so much resources used just to make one little small little chip? Just a little, little small. Why so much resources? The process. Why? The process. What is it? What's about, what about the process? Um, uh, refining it. So first, it's all related to keeping that computer chip clean. Yes. As you make that computer chip, if one little speck of dust gets on that computer chip, it's done, it's useless, it's pointless. Uh, so there's so much in terms of chemicals spent to make sure these everything's sterilized. So much amount of wind and air that's constantly blowing on these computer chips. That wind just doesn't come from nowhere. It's actually produced from machines. And so all of those resources just used to make that one little small little chip that's inside our phone. Because we're demanding it. Going back to uh, uh, consumption. Uh, other examples, I've said computers. Uh, where, you know, healthcare. Uh, healthcare, you know, where, you know, where in the world are people using more, I don't know why I did that, uh, syringes. Uh, where are people more likely to go to a doctor? Uh, developed countries, affluent countries, countries with high technology, especially in healthcare. And so what do you do with all those stuff? Those abandoned syringes. If you're in Scott County, you share them, and you all get AIDS. Uh, but you know, we think about other areas of the world, you just dispose of them. What do you do with that waste? What do you do with that stuff? Uh, so it's definitely, once again, a first world problem. It's related to our high technology, especially in the medical field. In which we got all these different trinkets and stuff that keeps us alive, you know, fights off cancer, for example, uh, but also produces more waste, uh, more harmful, more hazardous waste, stuff that uh, you don't want obviously kids uh, playing with. Further examples of technology, our freeway system. I mean, that's technology, I mean, civil engineers right now are drooling at the excitement of looking at that. They think that's the greatest thing in the world. That's technology. That's engineers and technology, research, algorithms and formulas. Uh, but also what that does is it allows people more easily, you know, more easily they can then drive from one place to another in their cities. Uh, so this is definitely you know, an example of high technology in terms of the infrastructure, the road networks. Very, very technologically innovative, and so what that means is people can live farther from uh, their, their workplace, so they can spread out, use more resources, and all that good stuff. It encourages car usage. What a mess. Look at that. Oh my god. There, well, there's a parking lot there. That's cool. Uh, anyway, uh, your computer. You think about your computers, it's not plastic. It's got all these various things. And one of the things is all these various things. They're not found in the same place. It's not like they just go to Africa and they find, oh, there's, there's all our minerals. Just scoop them up. They're from all over the world. And so they come from all over the world. They're transported all over the world to you, uh, sorry, to the factory where they make it and produce it and assemble it and send it off to uh, wherever you live and wherever you purchase it. And so once again, technology uh, requires more resources Requires more, uh, uh, which is only going to increase our environmental impact. Another way to showcase this is deforestation. Uh, so this is an Amazon rainforest. I'll come back and explain a little bit more about this a little bit later on. Uh, but this, this yellow line is a road network. Uh, so over time, what they've done is they've developed, they've kind of cut through this forested area. Uh, so what's, what's going on here, what does this have to do with technology? Uh, this is improvements in technology. You can cut and clear more forests than you ever could beforehand. Uh, so the Brazilian government doesn't do a good job of building the roads because essentially they encourage people to come out here uh, and deforest. Uh, but nonetheless, they're clearing forests much faster rate than ever before, and that's because of improvements in technology. Uh, it's much easier to clear forests than it was uh, be ever before. So another before and after image. We love before and afters. Uh, it's the massive amount of environmental change. What's causing this change? 
Um, I'll actually come back and explain that one next time. Uh, but it's, it's related to Fobu de Chao. I know it's probably, well, what the hell, Fobu de Chao? Uh, but Fobu de Chao is one of the key reasons why uh, you're seeing uh, deforestation. I'll go ahead and spill the beans because I can tell you you're wanting more. Uh, what it is is the global demand for steak. Uh, so another thing that comes with affluence is you eat more meat. And so globally, there's some reason there's this demand for Brazilian steak. Trust me, a cow, it's more where it is on the cow, is where the good meat is. It ain't where it's from, and, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, uh, you know, it's not like, well, you know, Texas has better cows, better meat, it's, it's from a cow, it depends on uh, what part of the cow. Uh, but there's this global demand for Brazilian steak. So what are Brazilians doing? Ah, we can make some money. We can clear this particular area, clear this forested area, and then convert it to pasture, convert, convert it to grazing for our cows, and essentially make some money. So before you couldn't make money on a rainforest. Now you can when you clear it and convert it to something else. Uh, so in 1990, 25 million cattle in Brazil has gone from 25 to 250 million. They increase the global demand for steak. Uh, so using particular techniques, slash and burn, all of this image here was rainforest. Now all that remains is rainforest, it's a little, little pocket here. All this has been cleared and changed and altered, uh, in this case for biofuels, uh, because now there's demand for sugar cane uh, and corn-based ethanol. Anyway, um, so let's go ahead and I'll end it there. Um, so I'm running out of time, uh, but let me go to assignment four. So assignment four, like I said, is available to you. Uh, but why I talk about assignment four today is it kind of relates to what we're talking about. Uh, so what this is, is this is uh, called the Ecological Footprint Quiz. Uh, so you simply go to this... Oh, ah, not What you use is you have this quiz. Uh, so this is a, not a quiz in which you're going to be great on how good of a human being you are. Uh, so what you're going to do is you're going to take this quiz and you're going to just, just be honest. It's going to ask you about 10 minutes worth of questions. And at the end it's going to give you what they call the ecological footprint. It's going to give you all kinds of data. And once again, I want you to just be honest, especially that first time. You're going to uh, uh, do this a couple of times. Uh, so be honest. So what you're going to do is then answer these questions. It's going to tell you uh, if everyone behaved like you, uh, there, we would need 4.9 Earths. Uh, so that just kind of showcases the environmental footprint. So if everyone behaved like you, it would require 4.9 Earths uh, compared to, let's say, if another person said, uh, did the quiz and they got, if everyone behaved like you, it would be 10.9 Earths. Uh, obviously, you're not as good environmentally as the other person. So this is a way you can also kind of be self reflecting. Uh, self -reflecting. Uh, so what this is, is essentially you take the quiz, you fill it out, you answer the question, you follow the directions, and what you're going to do is you're going to hand in a paper copy to me of your filling out a table, which is included in the assignment, but also your typed up written response, which is also included in uh, the assignment, and you're going to hand it to me uh, before uh, the exam, uh, exam four. So this is due Wednesday, April 29th at 4.30 p.m. You can turn it in whenever, you can do it tomorrow. Uh, but this is going to be something you hand in to me, and it's due before you turn in the exam. Or, sorry, before you take the exam. I, I would show you, but if you have questions, take a look at it. Cool. That's all I got.